Okay, hey, it's 1030 and we are going to get started here with the time of Bible study just for a few minutes. So if you're able to be with me live right now, wonderful. If you're going to join, if you're joining me later on, different day, different time, just glad you can be a part of us. Uh, so we are going to be in Romans chapter 8, actually preached on this text today. But I, this is one of my favorite sections of text in all of scripture. And so I just want to dwell on it a little bit longer. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 18 in just a couple minutes. But like I said, such a remarkable section of text and uh, one place in Scripture where the promise of the renewal of creation is made explicitly clear. And I know that for a lot of us, especially, you know, if, if, if you kind of grew up listening to sermons and so forth in the church, you just didn't hear a lot about the renewal of creation. I mean, you heard talk about heaven, but that always sounded like the place you, your soul went when you died. And, and that's true. That's, that's part of the story. It's just not all of the story. So, yes, again, like I've said so many times, when we die, our, if you're a believer in Jesus, your soul is with Jesus in heaven. And that soul is free from um, sin and death and so forth here on this earth. But that soul has not reached its final destination, if you will, because the final destination is this earth when God makes it new. So I've heard many people say to me, Pastor, look, I've never heard this new earth talk before. Where do you get this from? Well, many places in scripture, but this would be one key place to go. So I really want us to spend some time appreciating and just hearing what Paul's talking about because there's so much hope in here. Okay, so Romans 8, 18 is where we're going to spend our time, this, this section of text. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now you heard me if you listen to the sermon this morning. Again, you've got to pay very careful attention to the words that Paul is using. All right, first of all, he says, for I consider. Okay, this is the way I think. Paul is saying. And this is a good time for us to say, well, this is the way we should think. So how should we think about these things? So think about it this way. The sufferings of this present time. This present time is a key phrase, all right? He's not just saying the sufferings lately, the stuff just like the stuff just going around. No, this present time is a, a specific age that the scriptures understand. So it positions us in a certain age in God's salvation story. And this is the age of sin, suffering, sorrow, and death, brought on by Adam's sin and perpetuated by our sin. Okay, so we live in the age of sin, suffering, sorrow, and death. This is simply where we are. So the sufferings of this present age. And look, that word sufferings, you can fill that in with just about anything, all right? From brokenness in our body, to brokenness in our relationships, to brokenness in our culture, in um, our desires, in, in all different places where we experience brokenness and suffering. So that's a, that word, you can just pack it with all different kinds of, of hurt. And you, no doubt, have experienced some form of that suffering in some capacity in your life, you know what suffering feels like. So I mentioned this in the sermon, but this is the sober realism that Paul is establishing, that things are broken and don't be surprised if in this age of suffering, if you suffer. Just like I mentioned in the sermon, in cold season, don't be surprised if you get a cold. It's what happens in cold season, all right? So again, this present age is an age of suffering and sorrow, sin and death. So that's where we live. But Paul says it's not worth comparing, literally, not of equal value with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Glory, again, is the overwhelming effect of God's presence. It's the wow of God where you are totally overwhelmed and all you can do is say wow, where, where it, it envelops you. So I always like to use this story when I have time. Uh, years ago, before we had kids, we were out on the East Coast touring lighthouses and, and so forth. 
and uh, Rebecca and I and her parents were out there and uh, they have these beautiful lighthouses out there and they still, some of them are still functioning and some of them still have fog horns, all right? So <laughs> there was this lighthouse and it was sounding its fog horn every 30 seconds or so. But it was such a beautiful landscape. It was getting close to sunset and it was just, it was just breathtaking views. And so there were signs warning about the foghorn, but you know, we were interested in getting up on the, the, the cliff there and taking some pictures. And so you'd wait about 30 seconds, you'd cover your ears and you go back and you take some more pictures, wait 30 seconds, cover your ears. Well, I remember, I guess I lost count or just didn't count right, but I went around the backside of the uh, lighthouse and it's not that I heard the foghorn, I actually experienced it through my whole body because I came with about six feet of that foghorn when it went off and it just rattled my whole body. Okay, so in some ways, like this is the glory of God. It is so overwhelming. It, it's not that you just see it. It, it. Your whole body experiences it. Like I thought I was having lithotripsy right there on, on the uh, coast of, of Maine where we were. It was just rattling my whole body, but it was totally overwhelming. Uh, uh, there was almost substance to that sound. Well, take that and, and envelop, let that envelop you, the idea of God's glory being an overwhelming experience for the good, where it totally just fills you and uh, surrounds you and you experience it in basically pretty much all your senses. That's the idea. The sufferings of this time, they hurt. They hurt but they don't have equal value when compared to the glory that you're going to experience when Christ returns. And that's the age to come. So that's the second age that scripture conceptualizes. The age to come, the age of renewal, okay? Resurrection, renewal, reunion, refreshment, all those re, R-E words. Uh, this is what is in store. In fact, scripture says that Christ has initiated this age in his death and resurrection and the outpouring of the Spirit. We'll let Paul talk a little more about that here in a second. Okay, so he goes on. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So all creation, all creation. So this is part of the place where I keep coming back to when we talk about new earth. All creation is sitting on the edge of its seat. I mean, it's, it's eager anticipation. Can, like if you're at a concert and you can't wait for it to start, or if you're a kid and you can't wait for Christmas to get here or your birthday to get here, or if you're going on vacation and you just you can't wait another couple days before you, have, before you get to go, you're on the edge of your seat. You're just, this is anticipation is building. That's the idea. Creation on the edge of its seat just cannot wait for this revealing of the sons of God. Well, who are the sons of God? Why does creation care? Sons of God, just a, another way of saying inheritors of the kingdom. These are the baptized of God. This is the redeemed of God. If you were baptized into Christ and you believe in him and believe on him and call on him in faith, you are the redeemed. So you put your name in this phrase, sons of God. You put the name of your loved ones who have confessed Christ in this sons of God phrase. This is what creation's longing for when God's inheritors, the inheritors of the kingdom are revealed. Why does creation care who the inheritors of the kingdom are? Because what did Paul just say? All creation is going to be involved in this. So if you remember back to the Easter sermon, not a sword, not a scepter, but a shovel. The shovel is this instrument of creativity and life bringing. That's the idea here, is that we are going to reign with Christ over the entirety of the renewed creation. And creation's excited because it's going to be freed from the curse of Adam. Remember, cursed is the ground because of you, right? That's what God says to Adam. These are just haunting words. The creation will be set free and it will have good masters. Loving dominion will be practiced over this renewed creation. It'll be set free from its bondage to corruption, right? It's a, it's a wonderful promise. Okay, going on. For the creation, verse 20, was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. See? See what I mean? All creation set free. So um, there's this great hymn, you may have heard it before, called Joy to the World, right? No more that sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. How far? Far as the curse is found. How far is the curse found? Into the ground itself. 
By the way, <clears throat> did you know that Joy to the World actually is an Easter hymn? I mean, it's really an Easter hymn. We sing it at Christmas, that's just fine. But it's a great hymn to sing at Easter. Go back sometime and look at the words of Joy to the World. Think about it from an Easter perspective. It'll change the way you think about Joy to the World. It's a, it's a, it's a neat thing. Okay. Okay, so it's going to be set free from its bondage to corruption, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. See, in, in God's glory, there's freedom. Freedom from what? Sin, death, sorrow, suffering. Freedom from all that. And all creation is looking forward to being brought into that glory because it will be set free from all of that as well. Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. <clears throat> okay, so groaning. Creation groans. This isn't very hard to see. All you have to do is take a walk. You can hear, I mean, or just go to bed at night and hear, hear what sounds like cats being murdered outside your window. You've heard that before, right? Or you've seen evidence of um, predator and prey and the carnage left behind. Further, you've seen evidence of pollution and how we have wrecked creation, exploited it, done some pretty shameful things when it comes to caring for God's creation. So creation is, is groaning under this curse. And as I mentioned in the sermon, the poet nature is red in tooth and claw. There's no shortage of that evidence. You see it everywhere. Uh, it's either kill or be killed. It's kind of the rule of the land when it comes to what creation experiences. And we don't always help with that because of the pollution we pour into the land and the way that we exploit it. So this is a real thing. Like remember the word sufferings and all the things that we could pack into that word? Groaning, there's a lot we can pack into that word. I mean, this is a, a hugely significant, but a very, very dense word packed full of meaning. So all of creation <clears throat> groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, okay? And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. I'm going to come back to that. We groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so even we groan. You know that groaning. Man, if you live longer than five minutes in this world, you know that groaning. And you know that if you once you cross certain age milestones, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, you cross those milestones, there are new kinds of groaning that catch you off guard. But one day you, you wake up and realize that wasn't broken yesterday on my body and it's broken today, or that didn't hurt yesterday and it hurts today. And so you understand the pain associated with bodies that are broken and the groaning, I mean the literal groaning that all of us do, like going from horizontal to vertical or vertical to horizontal or up to sitting or sitting to up. Uh, sometimes those are very painful things. And so we do groan. But more than that, we groan in broken relationships. We groan in conflict. We groan over death. We groan over lost opportunities, lost potential. All those are ways that we groan in suffering and sorrow and sin and death. Why? Because that's the age we're in. We're in the age of sin and sorrow, suffering and death. So in this age, we groan. We groan in pain and we groan in lament. We groan in loss. And I know that every one of you watching, this is a very real and personal thing for you. I know in public, we often put on a happy face and pretend like everything's great. Everywhere else so happy. Everything's wonderful in our life. I know better because I know it my own life. We have pain, we have hurt, we have sorrow, we groan. So Paul's very, very honest. That's what I, mean, what I meant by it, that the sober realism. Scripture doesn't sugarcoat this at all. This is real for every single last one of us and we hurt in very profound ways. But I want you to notice something. Paul says that we have the first fruits of the Spirit. This is such a loaded phrase and so important to understand. So just the phrase, the word first fruits to begin with. <clears throat> this shows up repeatedly in scripture. You can talk about first fruits in terms of our giving, 
So we actually talked about this on Thursday evening with our book, Faith Reflection on Faith and Finances. The one of the biblical characteristics of a faithful steward is giving of our first fruits. So in other words, when you make your budget, the first item that you budget is your giving. So that, that's first, and then you make your budget on down from there. So that's first fruits. But it's also an image, use the, I like to use the image of end rows in the harvest. When the farmer takes off the end rows, that's the first fruit, right? So it gives them an idea of how the harvest is going to go. It's a very joyful time because it means the harvest has been initiated. It's a joyful time in the, a rural community because it means that, that all that labor and all that waiting is paying off. But no farmer harvests, harvests the end rows and then parks his combine and says, well, we're done. See, you understand that, right? That there means first, the, the end rows means there's more. First fruits mean this is the initiation, the initial gift of God as the age of renewal has already begun in a small way. And in fact, if you read some of the parables, they'll you know, talk about this, how it begins in a small way, but it grows. So the kingdom comes in a small way, even in a way that's not visible to the world, but God is already beginning to make people new in the most surprising of ways, through the waters of baptism, through the heard word, through the received sacrament, God is making us new. So we have one foot in this fallen age and one foot in the age to come. This is where we live in God's salvation story. But the significance of first fruits of the Spirit is this. All of God's Old Testament people, they were looking forward to the day when God would outpour His Spirit, pour His Spirit out, and initiate this age to come. Well, we have the initiation already. It's consummation, it's fullness, not yet. But we have the initiation, we have the down payment, the guarantee of the thing all of Scripture has been looking forward to, the age to come of renewal and restoration, resurrection and refreshment, okay? We have that now. We don't experience it in its fullness yet, but we have it now. And the assurance that we have of that is we have the first fruits of the Spirit. So the first fruits of the age to come renewal has come in the giving of the Holy Spirit who makes us new, who awakens faith in our hearts, who plants hope in our hearts, who tells us who Jesus is and highlights Jesus and converts our hearts so that we can know Jesus and have this hope. So yes, we groan, but we have the first fruits, the down payment, the initiation, the opening act of the age to come. We are experiencing already now. Okay. So Paul talks about the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So in this context, adoption of sons is a reference to redemption of our bodies. And you have to understand what a big deal that is. Your body, your body is going to be made new, redeemed, refreshed, renewed, reinvigorated, rejuvenated. Figure out whatever re-word you want, but it's going to be restored in a powerful way and shot through with the glory of God. And for the first time and probably the longest time you can remember, you're not going to hurt. Not in your mind, not in your body, nowhere. You're not going to hurt. You're going to be whole and well and joyful. This is what we're eagerly waiting for. So Paul says in verse 24, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So this waiting word is actually the same word that Paul uses earlier in reference to creation, eagerly waiting. So this is not a twiddle your thumb sort of waiting. This is an on the edge of your seat waiting, right? And that type of waiting is going to get attention from the world. I mean, if every time you sit on a seat, you sit on the edge of it, and kind of we're bouncing your knee and with eager anticipation. The world says, why, why are you doing that? Because I'm looking forward to the day my body is redeemed. I'm looking forward to the day creation's liberated from the curse. I'm looking forward to the day that my loved ones who are with Jesus are raised from the dead and I get to be with Jesus and with them and reign with Christ as a co-regent over his renewed creation. I can't wait for that to get here. This is why it's such a big deal because you're not living just to die, okay? You are living to live. You're not living to leave the whole world behind. You're living to see the whole world renewed. So you're not, you don't have to get all your 
fun things in, complete your bucket list to have a complete life because if you die before your bucket list is done, then you missed out and you lost out on all kinds of fun things and you're just going to float off and live on a cloud forever. No, that's the heaven of comic books. That is not the heaven of scripture. Scripture is not a comic book. It's a cosmic book. And the whole promise is that this earth will be restored, released from the curse, and that your body and your loved one's bodies who trusted in Jesus, that their bodies will be raised and restored and there will be reunion and will reign with Christ. It's absolutely astonishing stuff. Like it should almost make you blush because it's so embarrassingly amazing. But that's the promise. So why wouldn't you wait on the edge of your seat? Who could hear that and say, yeah, someday, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm not that excited about it. It'll happen someday, maybe. I got other things to do right now. There's nothing here worth comparing to what we're going to experience. I mean, C.S. Lewis talks about that, that, we, that we're too easily pleased. We settle for too little. He talks about making mud pies in a slum and d d um, rejecting the opportunity for what he calls a holiday at sea, but basically to go out sailing, and we don't know what that means. We so say, no thanks, I'm just gonna sit here and make some mud pies, mud puddles, mud, just play in the mud, because I can't figure out what you're even talking about. So sometimes, because we don't understand, we, we, are, we have this sort of stunted hope. It, it's sort of a very narrow, uh, um, myopic, uh, it's almost like it's been put through the dryer and it's shrunk so small that we're like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. This is the biggest deal in the world because it's going to involve the whole world. And your body, made new, on the new earth, free, creation free, reigning with Christ. That's the promise. I'm waiting for it. And I pray that, that your life is directed with that sort of joyful anticipation. And really, if that gets in your heart, I mean, that changes the way you move through life. It changes the way you support the mission ministry of the church, doesn't it? Because why wouldn't you want that message to be shared? That, that's what Christ put his church here for. So people can hear that message and be nourished by it and, and, and filled with hope. So, I mean, can you think of a better place to invest your treasure? I can't. So God's blessings on your week. Um, um, the, again, my encouragement is I think, love Romans 8. Just, there's so much in there. We, there's way more than we have time to get to today. Love, love this promise. Th this is good stuff. Uh, and then uh, next week, just be aware, the next couple Sundays, I won't be here for the Bible study time. Um, the worship still happens at 9 o'clock. Pastor Rigard's up next Sunday, and Pastor Johnson's up the Sunday after that. But I won't have a Bible study time afterwards. But 